Okay, good morning and welcome to our seventh seminar uh, on research data management. And today we have two guests here. That is Martin Urban from TU Dortmund and Lars Schumann from the Ruhr University Bochum. And they will talk about handling HPC data within the cluster of excellence resolve. Thank so you, Oliver. And uh, welcome everyone. My name is Lars Schumann and I am Research Data Manager at uh, Resolve, uh, the Cluster of Excellence, Ruhr Explores Solvation. And together with my colleague Martin Urban, I will show you today how uh, the Cluster of Excellence has devised its RDM strategy with a special focus on high performance computing data. For that, I will be introducing the Cluster of Excellence. I will tell you something about our RDM strategy. I will introduce the uh, research data repository resolve data and outline the uh, future perspectives and the roadmap in all things RDM. Then Martin Urban will take over and lead you through a case study about how to integrate large volume HPC data into the resolve RDM scheme. He will uh, discuss the data in question, um, raise the issue of storage and then show you some of our recommendations and lead off into a nice and lively discussion. Finally, uh, we would like to show you briefly uh, the basic functionalities of the repository Resolve data. We are Resolve, the cluster of excellence for salvation science. Uh, Resolve is a collaboration between three universities in the Ruhr area, employs about 190 scientists, is very international and diverse, has a big focus on young researchers and early career scientists, uh, is funded by DFG, federal government, and the state of North Rhine-Westphalia with right now over 100 million euros since 2012, has at the moment two dedicated uh, research buildings, the CEMOS from which I am streaming and the Caledo in Dortmund. And as you can see, in the past, there have been a lot of uh, publications, some of them also very high impact ones, but uh, publishing is also a task of the present and the future. So research data is basically the lifeblood of the cluster. The, what is solvation science? This is all about understanding the role of the solvent at the molecular level. This may be in situ under extreme conditions, outside of equilibrium states and within inhomogeneous phases. Uh, this can be, for example, the solvent control uh, and protein aggregation and fibril formation, which is related to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it plays a big role in the development of new energy uh, transport technologies, uh, so storage and generation. Uh, it is a relevant factor in astrochemistry and questions of early life, maybe on Earth or in space. And also from an engineering point of view, solvation cannot be ignored uh, since it is a key factor in developing environmentally friendly processes, so-called green chemistry. Resolves research can be roughly divided into three research areas. The first one uh, dealing with local solvent fluctuations in heterogeneous systems. The second one having to do with the solvent control of chemical dynamics and reactivity. And area three dealing with solvation under extreme conditions. We investigate these solvation processes on the molecular, molecular level uh, across scales of time and length. So as you may have uh, gathered up till now, it is one of two clusters of excellence with a clear focus on chemistry. The researchers are applying cutting edge technologies, for example, laser spectroscopy, scanning microscopy and molecular dynamics simulation, and especially or theory related uh, methodologies have a clear uh, relation to high performance computing needs and practices. We also seek the rapid transfer of research findings into innovative technologies, for example, in areas of research conversion and storage, development of smart sensors, and improving catalysis. Uh, since the RDM, the research data management is increasingly uh, important in today's research, Resolve has devised a task force uh, that deals specifically with questions 
uh, pertaining research data and its management. The task force consists of principal investigators and participating scientists from four different subsectors that I will explain shortly. And uh, on the other hand, uh, has an extensive technical team consisting of um, data stewards, data curators, um, application managers, and researchers from theory and uh, experiment that give direct feedback on ideas and concepts of the task force. This is uh, done to ensure that the research data management is driven by researchers' uh, requirements as much as policies. Now, I told you a little bit about subsectors. So you can see there are three abstract research areas, but uh, considering methodology, they can be uh, divided into four main subsectors one being spectroscopy and imaging, one being theory, which has a high a connection to HPC applications, one being synthesis, and the fourth one, engineering. So one of the main issues and challenges is that uh, we need to devise solutions that work for all subsectors. This begins at the question which electronic lab notebooks are to use, which repositories are suitable and which are not, um, what metadata schemas and uh, can we employ, and how can uh, standards of, for example, the National Research Data Initiative be integrated into the concepts as well. On the other hand, technical aspects play a role as, for example, user rights management, accessibility, the question of storage uh, and latency, of course. The requirements to a, of a successful RDM infrastructure can be roughly divided into two. Uh, main areas, the first one being the technical side, the second one, the organizational one. So from a technical point of view, a uh, successful RDM infrastructure um, needs to be able to attach all data categories to a large and cloud-based storage. Um, we need high bandwidth access, or the researchers rather. Um, it is important that uh, a low barrier and cluster overarching authentication and authorization service is in place as, for example, the DFN AAI. Uh, it should be possible to define resource specific metadata standards and allow for additional annotation schemes and uh, ideally a seamless export of data along the data temperature gradient uh, should be possible. I will explain this in a moment. From an organizational point of view, uh, it is important that the strategy employed is reusable for other collaborative initiatives. Um, so uh, the work we do has uh, further use uh, outside of the cluster of excellence as well. It is uh, yeah, required that we develop uh, NFDI compliant publication models, of course, and uh, as a third uh, important fact, the organizational structures um, related to all these processes and challenges need to be defined and implemented. For example, how are the RDM team, the IT and media center, uh, the university library, the RDM task force, and the individual work groups and researchers connected? How do they interact? All questions that need to be answered. So the data life cycle basically comes down to the question, which data goes where and when. And um, the hot data is fresh of the uh, detect devices, so to say. This is uh, unpublished data that is uh, relatively fresh. Uh, it is shared within a work group and mostly stored on local storage devices and in form of electronic uh, laboratory notebooks. Here in red, uh, there are given some options uh, that exist for some of the technical solutions. Um, the warm data has been analyzed or partly analyzed, is now ready to be exchanged with collaborators, uh, but also needs a place. So this would come in form of a form of repository, um, but not necessarily uh, a repository that allows publication already, uh, since this might be things in development or um, research data that still needs further analysis from another point of view. Uh, thirdly, there's cold data that is uh, published 
data and that needs a place as well, a place that allows for persistent identifier, uh, a place that allows interfacing with reviewers when in the process of submitting your works um, to journals. So as you can see, there are a lot of options and right now not really a clear path of which ones are the best. So there's a lot of finding out trial and error and strategizing involved. One of the basic requirements to the research data is that it must be fair. So following the principle of being findable, accessible, interoperable and reproducible. So in this chart, we outline the basic flow of data here, beginning with the raw data coming either from experiments or theory that can then either go in its raw form or processed by being analyzed by software and tools uh, and being annotated with metadata into, for example, electronic lab notebooks. So this is an early draft <coughs> of the task force, which was later then uh, revised, but Electronic notebooks have uh, a really great advantage that they um, allow a, a good overview and help with the uh, metadata annotation uh, automatically. But a problem is uh, storing data in electronic lab notebook format requires terabytes of data storage. Uh, as you remember, the hot, uh, in case of the hot data on a local level, um, which then gets expensive really fast and also has a high administrative overhead. Also questions of data integrity and curation are not answered uh, satisfyingly. So the task force came to the conclusion that a suitable repository is required. A central resolved repository should be the core of the RDM strategy. Um, such a repository should allow the communication with different RDM tools and workflows uh, the incorporation of metadata schemas um, should allow working uh, and archive storage. So from a technical point of view, also within this repository, publication should be possible. So it should be able to uh, assign DOIs. And another important factor is the um, connection to modern storage systems like S3 or Ceph. So in the process of finding a solution here uh, to uh, technical platforms were uh, the most interesting ones, uh, Invenio and Dataverse. And while both had their um, advantages and disadvantages, especially in the case of Dataverse, the option to have multiple Dataverses with their own respective metadata schemas uh, was, in the end, uh, one of the deciding factors. But still questions remained, such as to how to deal with automated synchronization uh, if ELN comp compatibility uh, was possible and how to deal with theory data. But on the third question, we'll see some examples uh, soon. So Dataverse and also other repositories such as GitLab, which is specialized for software, fits right into this storage level here, which shares electronic lab notebooks uh, as well, since all three allow for some kind of storage, but on different levels and with different accessibilities. And from the repositories, now the data can be exported in form of supplementary information assigned with a DOI. Uh, it can be shared with collaborators and um, by sharing the data, it becomes possible to use the data as a training resources for artificial intelligence. Um, the NFDI compliance is assured by using defined repository standards. And as well, the archiving issue has been resolved, so to say, um, by coupling it with the S3 storage. So there we have it, the repository resolved data. Um, the repository is based on Dataverse 6. It is a generic curated repository considering resources many disciplines. The central infrastructure is maintained by the IT and Media Center and the Research Data Service of TU Dortmund University, as it is technically a sub-instance of the institutional repository Tudo Data. Resolve Data can issue Resolve DOIs um, that have the following form here and allow uh, for an easy 
um, options to um, recognize it. The Dataverse allows for a high granularity of read-write permissions down to the dataset level as well. Right now, it runs on five servers, two application servers, one NFS server, an R server for our tabular ingest and a PostgreSQL to connect storage via S3 interface to the research data storage of Nordrhein-Westphalia. An API access is possible. Uh, right now, files up to three gigabyte can be uploaded to the Dataverse and unpublished data sets are being stored for 10 years according to good research practice. Now, why use Resolve Data? The repository is following the FAIR principles. Publication with the Resolve DOI enhances the visibility of scientific work and of the cluster as a whole. Unpublished data sets can be shared for review or collaboration within the cluster or beyond. Uh, for us as administrators of Resolve, statistical analysis on the key metrics are really interesting and possible now. And from a scientific point of view, this repository of well-curated data can feed the training process of prospectively competent machine learning models, which is a problem till now. What is published in Resolve Data? Data publications only. So raw and or processed data, which are to be shown in published works of the researchers. Ideally, uh, all data publications of projects with Resolve Acknowledgement Statement uh, are published in Resolve Data, but minimally all data publications of works done by Resolve funded primary authors are published within. But if uh, a researcher has already or partly published in another repository, they can still link other data publications under a Resolve DOI. So how is the process of publishing data in Resolve Data look? Uh, well, it is basically a tandem process. So between the researchers and the research data management. On the researcher side, they just create an account, uh, log into the Dataverse. Uh, for the first time, they contact uh, data, research data management, which then creates their specific Dataverse and assigns the appropriate rights. Uh, within that Dataverse, the researchers can then create their data set, assign the metadata, upload the data uh, they want, and submit it for review. Now, the review process or curation is one of the key steps here in the repository as the data curators for data management. Now, take a look that the FAIR principles are uh, ensured. Then they contact the researchers and either greenlight uh, their publication or tell them the uh, issues uh, that they found. And in the end, publication still is in the hand of the researchers themselves. Accompanying this whole process is the option and uh, offer of a support. What if my data does not fit in Resolve Data? Well, if specific repositories fits bet fit better, then researchers can just create a metadata publication as illustrated here below and link to the original. So here on the right side, we have uh, the metadata publication within Resolve Data which just hints that um, the data set is found at radar for chem uh, which is shown here on the left side. What are the perspectives of Resolve Data? Well, one of the uh, biggest issues right now is uh, the direct integration of electronic lab notebooks, export functionalities uh, for a seamless interfacing between ELNs and the repository. What I'm working uh, with great focus right now is um, to devise more efficient publication processes and uh, develop best practices that are based on the researchers' experiences and feedback. A uh, point of great discussion in the task force is the definition of resource-specific metadata fields, uh, as this is not an easy task. And of course, as I outlined earlier, uh, cluster-wide data publication analytics are of great interest for us. And then once uh, a sufficient amount of well-curated salvation data is accessible, the training of interesting machine learning models is the next step. On a broader scale, what are our next steps uh, in RDM in general? Well, this mostly concerns the electronic lab notebooks here. So for ChemMotion, uh, we have selected pilot users 
it is not yet centrally managed um, and we query the researchers about their general interest as well. Uh, site form site formation has no site overarching projects yet, no Dataverse export functionality, but we are in discussion with the developers to uh, add this tool to the ELN consortium, which is uh, actively working on such an export interface. Then thirdly, ELAB FTW, the third ELN in this list, uh, is in pilot use at TU Dortmund University. Uh, and we know that the export to Dataverse is a hot work in progress project. Uh, on the contrary, for GitLab, uh, as both a software uh, development tool and repository, uh, the UARU instances are available on all three uh, UARU universities, uh, and each researcher can add project members from any site. Export to Dataverse is possible via the API. And with that, I hand over to Martin Urban. Yeah, thank you, Lars. I want to give the second part of our talk, which will be the case study. And here we will focus on how to integrate large HPC data into the Resolve RDM. And this will basically um, is about the data in question and uh, the main issue of the storage of data, which is up to multiple terabyte in sizes. And I will close with, uh, with our recommendation of how to handle these data. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves when we are dealing with an HPC system is, what are we dealing with actually? And this is a question that isn't easily answered because um, basically you can't answer it once for all. Every site has its own procedure, basically. It's, this is because of the heterogeneous environments you are dealing with. Um, every site has their own different accessibility to data on each cluster. So, for example, some have internet access, some doesn't. Um, then, in addition, there's uh, you have to differentiate between the local RDM solutions, for example, if your university has a GitLab instance or not, and federated RDM solutions, for example, a resource data for the uh, resource members or co signs for universities in NRW. If you're working in a tier two system in uh, Bavaria, you have other accessibility suddenly. And basically, what I can only advise everyone is uh, to include your local support, uh, which is still necessary. This is usually the local HPC team and uh, or your local RDM team, because those people usually know what is available and what you can do and what you can use. And they will usually give you advice and help you whenever you have questions. Um, for the sake of this case study, we will focus on TU Dortmund because this is where I am from and I can tell you things. But the overall general procedure should be everywhere possible. Also, details might vary from side to side. Um, so what are the HPC and RDM toolkits which are available at TU Dortmund? So first of all, we have our tier three system, our uh, Lido three cluster. This is our main production system where most of our HPC users are working on. And this is also where most of the data is being generated. And for RDM toolkits, we have on one hand, our GitLab instance of uh, our university, which is primarily for software development. Then, we have uh, Skibo, which is uh, an NRW-wide uh, solution. Also, this is mainly a temporary file share, usually, and not uh, not entirely suitable for an RDM over 10 years. And the next one is Tudor Data, which uh, Lars already mentioned, which is a Dataverse instance and is suitable for publication. And the sub instance of Tudor Data is actually the resource data we are talking today about. 
And also, this is an so this is basically working on Tuto data, which is a site-specific uh, dataverse. Resource data has a feder federated um, solution. So every member of Resolve in the Uahua can access it and use it for their publications. And last but not least, we have Cosign, which is uh, basically the data archive in our toolkit. And importantly, that is and what all those tools have in common is that they can be used in a collaborative work, which is quite important if you're talking about HPC data, uh, especially if we are going for uh, simulations or something like this, where we have theoretical data and for publications we usually work with experiment uh, with uh, experiment experimental workers as well. And so the collaborative work is quite important for us on HPC systems. Despite the toolkits, we have many different HPC applicants and user groups on an HPC system. So, so maybe the biggest portion of HPC users are usually the application users who are only doing productions or sometimes also analysis on the HPC system and a smaller portion of the user groups are developers themselves who are programming their own software and also uh, running their test suits uh, for the newer versions of new functionalities. Of course, it isn't this black and white and you have many uh, in-between there and when you have people who are bug fixing or using their own codes, which are also developed in the same work group. Usually you are dealing with quite a wide variety on different skill levels for the user group. So a developer is usually someone who is quite um, familiar and versatile in, in working with an HPC system or with programming languages and has a fundamental knowledge of what he's doing, hopefully. And application users can sometimes just be people who are coming from a Windows machine and wants to run their jobs more um, efficiently, but they hardly have any knowledge of an HPC system or of Unix or anything. So if we would want to take every group into account, this talk would uh, still go on tomorrow uh, or other days. And so it's neither possible nor feasible to discuss every group in this talk. So we, what we want to show is to focus on a molecular dynamic simulation for the case study, which is an app uh, production application. So we are focusing on the application users and what is uh, special for molecular dynamic simulation is that they routinely generate lots of data with their uh, various systems. So to give a quick rundown of how the data can look like, it's first important to know what MD simulation is actually is. So MD simulation is an atomistic simulation with use of physical force fields. And it's a simulation with classical mechanics. So we are not dealing with quantum mechanics usually. And the systems can be small chemical molecules up to larger proteins. For example, here you can see uh, an ion channel protein embedded in a lipid bilayer surrounded by water with ions. And so systems can even go up to whole cells in the solution. So you have a quite variety in systems and therefore also in the resulting uh, storage capacity which is needed. And what you are calculating with the dynamics are tra trajectories and usually your properties are derived from those tra trajectories. And additionally, other pro uh, properties can be calculated as well like uh, predominantly free energies, for example. Um, 
but those aren't that um, hard to handle because they are not that large as like a trajectory actually. Uh, what what also makes the MD simulation quite useful as a case study is that it's a GPU heavy application. And this is something that you can understand when you look at the uh, development of MD simulations that you have in the last when we look at the benchmarking for Ember TPU performance, for example, that this is a good trend of how the simulation time in the last years is steadily increasing and it's almost doubling around 33 months each. So we don't own, only have a steadily increasing trajectory size, but also steadily increasing storage capacity needed for those uh, increasing trajectories. And this is quite a challenge for RDM actually, this development. And the development uh, only gets worse for RDM because um, usually the hardware is getting faster and faster. Currently, the uh, softwares are working on better parallel performance between multiple GPUs and multiple GPU nodes. So this trend could also get a bit steeper still. And this is a challenge for RDM because we have to plan an RDM system for multiple years. And so we, we have to take into account this steadily increasing demand for storage, of course. And, but this is an, a trend which is exclusively for MD simulations, but can be seen for almost all HPC applications out there. That with new hardware generations, you have a steadily increasing storage capacity needed. So when we are talking about MD simulations, we have different um, files we have to take into account when we're looking at a good uh, research data management. So the first thing is uh, storage for the trajectories, which are our primarily output. And this output can be up to multiple terabyte in sizes. Then you have your analyzing scripts with uh, version controlling, which can be done ideally via GitLab or something like this. And then you have generally smaller input files, which is usually your input structures and your simulation scripts. And in addition, your used force fields and program versions. Also, the last two ones are usually externally provided. And in publications, you tend to just cite those um, things. But this is also a problem when you're only citing your force fields and your program. What if the program of Fossil isn't available anymore in two, five, or ten years? I mean, we happen to experience this in our actual work that a peer of mine was doing something with a program that wasn't running on modern systems anymore because we didn't have an old enough interlibrary left. So this is something where containerization could be useful. Uh, to think about, but um, I don't want to talk too much about containerization in this talk. Also, this is always a suitable option for an uh, RDM to attach a container with all your inputs so that everyone could just take the container and uh, run it again. Lars already told you about the different data temperatures and um, now, when we look at the MD simulations, we can say that the hot data or the very hot data we are dealing with are the trajectories, which are our primarily outputs with the MD simulations. And why is are they very hot? It's because on an HPC cluster, you're dealing with um, storage, which is usually not backup. So the first thing you always should do is when dealing uh, with an HPC system and your generating output is to save it as fast as possible on a backup storage system. Once you start to analyze uh, the trajectories, this is when the data becomes warm. And this is also the collaborative step when you start to exchange figures, tables, numbers 
with um, colleagues. And once the data has published, then it becomes cold. The main issue with uh, MD simulations, oftentimes the trajectories are not exhaustively analyzed for a single publication. So this means that the data can stay hot even after being published. And this is something that leads to a publication predicament, what to do with the data actually. So you can have a very diverse uh, questions with the same data and therefore it's not always necessary to publish the full trajectory uh, in after, uh, after all. And this is an even often desired. On one hand, it can mean that you want to do follow-up work based on the same trajectory as possible. And if you now publish everything, it could be that someone else is using your data to do analysis you had planned in the future. And therefore you could uh, impact your future publications negatively which is an ideal, um, but sadly we are not living in an ideal world. And when everyone is fighting for uh, funding with their uh, applications, sadly, and when there are people out there that try to cut costs with their computation by just analyzing already available trajectories, this could happen, sadly. And to fight this problem and this predicament. Some journals already have their data publication pol uh, policies, which must be complied with accordingly if you want to publish in those journals. And oftentimes these policies are actually discipline specific. So if you're doing a uh, and deep simulations, the journals will tell you what you have to publish uh, accordingly. Now we can ask, okay, now we have our uh, storage and we want to, uh, we have our data and we want to publish it. Um, what do we do with so much data? First of all, you always have to keep in mind that RDM conform data search isn't free or isn't completely free. So if you are looking, for example, uh, Shasim, which is a journal for chemical simulations, they are offering three different repositories who, uh, which gives the uh, scientists some um, free storage to, uh, per publication. So for example, Sinol can give you 50 gigabyte, Fixture 20 gigabyte, or try it 50 gigabyte, which then costs $150 once. And then they keep the data there for 10 years. But if you want to go beyond those, um, initial uh, volumina of storage, then it can get quite expensive. Um, for example, Fixture uh, allows for bigger publications, or bigger data for the publication, and then suddenly you are about $3,500 per single publication. And if you think about the numbers that Lars told you earlier, when you have a resource cluster with multiple thousands of publications, then this could become quite expensive overall and just for the storage of the data. Tried also allows for bigger storages, but um, they don't even go into the terabyte even. So, so you are kept with some hundred gigabytes there. Overall, it can be actually cheaper to just reduce the calculation instead of storing the big outputs. So this is when you have to rate the cost of the storage against the cost of the new computation uh, time. Why don't we just do a reduce every calculation instead of giving too much thought into RDM? Um, and isn't this just feasible to do so? And the short answer is perhaps. It can be cheaper and easier to just reduce the calculations but those are highly depending on the type of applications you're dealing with, whether you are having checkpoints or restart files, or and it's highly depending on the type of data you're dealing with. So if you're looking at MD simulations, we have oftentimes statistically rare events we are observing, like a specific ion transition through an ion channel, for example, and those 
rare events can't be easily reproduced with each run, and so we, we should actually keep those trajectories and not only uh, not just delete and say, okay, we have the input data, uh, let's redo it. Then again, we have the issue that what happens if our application isn't supported anymore in modern hardware? I mean, no one knows what uh, we are dealing with in five years or eight years when the data could be still in, uh, relevant uh, RDM-wise, but it's not reproducible anymore because the uh, source code isn't available or the binary. And what we are one uh, what we are trying to do is that um, we are using resource data to host the metadata, the relations, and the metadata for the trajectories. And that cosine is actually suitable as a storage then for large trajectories. And this would also lead to my last part of the talk about what do we actually recommend of how to proceed with our large data. And first of all, you should always publish a reduced data set. This is valid for everything. And if you are having um, trajectories with multiple terabytes of size, and what we would recommend is a metadata publication where only the metadata is being published in your um, repository, for example, with resource data, and that the raw data is stored on an archiving platform like Cosign. The data versus resource data is suitable for a class internal usage, and it could also an RDM conform saving a storage of trajectories, but because of the size limitation of resource data, we don't really recommend this. And instead, you can use Cosine as a data handler for large trajectories for your publications. And what you would then do is that you provision your data upon request. And this can be done in Cosine by assigning the role guest to access the data. This way you can provide your data, which is stored on Cosign, by meanwhile your publication data is um, as a publication repository of resource data. Now it's the question, could you just go and uh, use our uh, concept? And the answer is sadly no. Um, resource data is in production and is functional and it's fine, but our current problem is that Cosign is on one hand technically ready to use and the test cases are fine, but the productive use in the Uahua is yet to be approved by the staff councils of every member university separately and this is still something that is pending at the time of this talk. We hope that it can soon be uh, go into production but sadly we have still to wait for it. Um, but our resource RDM concept that Lars presented here today is something that can generally be transferred and adapted easily by using institutional platform set of something like resource data. And this can be seen when we look at our resource uh, RDM strategies that we have here, our Dataverse repository, and by replacing the resource data just by your own Dataverse, you can then use this concept for your own institute or cluster or whatever. And the same is for the archiving here as a as three storage that you can not only use your cosine, but if you have another archiving uh, solution, then you can use this, of course. So this already leads me to the summary of my of this small case study. Um, that we have that um, we have especially in with HPC MD simulations files and data that can amount to multiple terabyte in size. That it's always uh, that you should always prioritize all data required to reproduce your experiments and the figures and tables of your publications, of course. And for the trajectories, it's 
usually the best way to extract represent representatively clustered structures out of it. And if you are dealing with statistically rare events, then you should publish your trajectories, of course. But if you are uh, working with ensemble averages um, out of your trajectory, then it's not really needed. Um, for publications, you should only uh, publicate your metadata of all the trajectories and not directly store the trajectory in your um, RDM repository and instead use archiving platforms that is, such, such as Cosigns for such large data storages. And this would uh, introduce us to the discussions I want to kick off at this point. Um, we are still working on the best practices for uh, RDM. So I showed you how you could handle large theoretical raw data so far, but of course we still have to see it in production and get feedback from our users to actually uh, see if this best practice is up to the reality. The granularity of metadata schemes are still something that is um, yet to be fully seen of how far you have to go there and um, you have to keep in mind the consistency in electronic lab notebooks usages. What we want to do is to devise easy to adopt policies that satisfy the NFDI criteria to motivate researchers to invest time into CRDM because although it can be work initially, it can also save work for your peers which follow you years later. And you have always asked yourself what data and thesis must be published and what should or what have to be remains internal. Yeah, it's, I, at this point I would ask you about your experiences and ask if you have questions and thank you for your attention.